Spring? Is that you? Warmer temps mean new Allbirds styles. Meet the Super Light Collection, the lightest ever shoes from Allbirds, now in fresh colors. They've designed must-have travel styles for when you need to jet. The lighter-than-air feel and barely-there fit makes these shoes some of the most packable styles ever. That means more comfort and less baggage. Take the Super Light Tree Runner on your next adventure. Its cushy, lightweight foam midsole supports every step, and the extra outsole traction gives you the grip to just go for it. The eucalyptus fiber upper adds next-level breathability to keep you going all day. Plus, the Super Light Tree Runner is comfortable and ready to go right out of the box. So, what can you do in a Super Light shoe? What can't you do is the better question. And because they're super packable, the real question is, where are you taking them? Experience how Allbirds redefines comfort. Visit Allbirds.com and use code SUPER24 for a free pair of socks with a purchase of $48 or more. That's A-L-L-B-I-R-D-S dot com, code SUPER24. Judy was boring. Hello. Then Judy discovered Jumbacasino.com. It's my little escape. Now Judy's the life of the party. Oh, baby, mama's bringing home the bacon. Whoa, take it easy, Judy. <laughs> The Chumba Life is for everybody. So go to ChumbaCasino.com and play over 100 casino-style games. Join today and play for free for your chance to redeem some serious prizes. ChumbaCasino.com. No purchase necessary. Void where prohibited by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details. Hi, everyone. This is Scott. If you're a fan of the ancient world, please support the Patreon page at Patreon.com forward slash the ancient world. Thanks again for listening. While a bit less famous than the Mesha stele, the Tel Dan stele is equally important to our knowledge of Iron Age Syria. The stele's inscription is probably best known for its reference to the royal house of Judah as the house of David, considered the most significant and perhaps only extra-biblical archaeological reference to this house. But when subjected to the scholar's eye, it also provides additional context on the death of three kings. The author of the text is Hazael who succeeded Hadad Azer to the throne of Aram Damascus in 842 BC. The first few lines of the Tel Dan stele record the death of his predecessor. The fragmentary text reads, Against my father he went up against him when he fought at Abel, and my father lay down, he went to his ancestors. Which sounds pretty thin and cryptic, right? But according to historian Stuart Irvine, Abel is probably the same as Abila of Lysanias, the chief city of the Tetrarchy of Abilene in Roman times, sighted along an ancient road leading from the southern end of the Bekaa Valley through the anti-Lebanon range to Damascus. It's here, he proposes, that Hadad Azer fought his last great battle against Shalmaneser III. After retreating inside the walls of Damascus, Hadad Azer died, and Hazael records that, after his death, Hadad made me king. On his return to Syria the following year, Shalmaneser confirmed the transition, saying, When Hadad Azer died, Hazael, the son of a nobody, seized the throne, mustered his large army, and came out against me, offering battle and fight. He concludes that I battled with him and defeated him. The term son of a nobody, which we've heard before, was a Syrian slang for a usurper. According to historian K. Lawson Younger Jr., this strongly suggests that Hazael was not the first in line of succession and had seized the throne in an unusual manner. It also suggests that his own father was not a legal member of the major branch of the contemporary royal family. Hazael's inscription on the Tel Dan stele then turns to a different matter. He records that the king of Israel had entered previously into my father's land, 
Hadad went in front of me, and I departed from my kingdom, and I slew seventy kings, who harnessed thousands of chariots and thousands of horsemen. I killed Jehoram, son of Ahab, king of Israel, and I killed Ahaziah, son of Jehoram, king of the house of David. And I set their towns into ruins and turned their land into desolation. The seventy kings is commonly interpreted as meaning two powerful kings. But the rest takes a bit of unpacking. In episode C-17, I noted that sometime around 900 BC, King Bar-Hadad of Aram Damascus had seized the city of Ramoth-Gilead from the Israelite king Basha. In episode C-18, I discussed how, immediately after the Battle of Karkar, King Ahab of Israel and King Jehoshaphat of Judah joined forces to try to retake the city, an attempt that cost Ahab his life. So the line on the Tel Dan stele about the king of Israel had entered previously into my father's land likely referred to this incident. The rest of the inscription is pretty straightforward, but when you line it up with the biblical account, you can pull some additional context. Because it looks like while Hazael was fighting Shalmaneser, the kings of Israel and Judah tried one more time to reclaim Ramoth-Gilead. And once Shalmaneser moved off toward the coast, Hazael rallied the Damascene army to confront combined Jewish forces. In his own inscribed words, he killed both kings. But the biblical account injects some additional nuance. The kings we're talking about, Jehoram and Ahaziah, were both descendants of King Omri. I mentioned in episode C-17 that, according to historian Philip Capek, Omri may have had a brother, or other comparably aged male relative, named Nimshi. This is likely the Nimshi of the Tel Rahav bee yard and the fortune of wax and honey. And the contemporary scion of this well-heeled clan was an Israelite noble named Jehu. By 841 BC, King Jehoram had elevated Jehu to the rank of Israelite general. In the biblical account, Jehoram had been seriously wounded, but not killed, in the fighting at Ramoth-Gilead. Recuperating in the city of Jezreel, he was attended by his royal nephew, King Ahaziah of Judah, who, in this version, was also not dead. And it was in this setting that the Nimshiite general Jehu arrived, pulled out his bow, and shot Jehoram through the heart. He also grievously wounded Ahaziah, who later expired in Megiddo. So either Hazael killed both kings, or Jehu did, or possibly some mix of the two. Either way, Jehu proceeded with great dispatch to complete his Israelite coup. Step one took place in the city of Jezreel. The queen mother Jezebel formerly of Tyre, daughter, wife, and mother of kings, was not about to see her line so easily dispossessed. And seeing the usurper Jehu approach, she hurled down vicious insults from her balcony, until Jehu ordered her personal eunuchs to throw her down to the pavement, which they did. Though probably instantly killed by the fall, Jehu trampled her body with his chariot, then left the remainder for the dogs. Not a man for subtlety was our Jehu. He then ordered his nobles to hunt down and kill all members of Omri's line. And soon enough, the heads of seventy Omride princes were piled near the city gates. Once this was completed, the new King Jehu felt comfortable enough to enter Samaria in triumph. Meanwhile, in Judah, the throne vacated by Ahaziah's death was seized by his mother, Athaliah, sister of the recently killed Israelite king Jehoram, who, 
also killed all her Omride relatives to help secure her own throne. Ay, ay, ay. One last thing before we head back north. I mentioned earlier that we're pretty confident that all these events, the deaths of Hadad Azer, Jehoram, and Ahaziah, and the usurpation of their thrones, happened in quick succession. The source for this is a certain obelisk now sitting in the British Museum. We'll cover the Black Obelisk of Assyria, or Black Obelisk of Shalmaneser, more next episode. For now, I just wanted to mention two things. First, the obelisk is the only Assyrian source we have for Shalmaneser's campaigns from 840 BC onward. And second, the same year that he first battles Hazael, Shalmaneser also records marching his army to the Mediterranean, where he accepted tribute from the men of Tyre, Sidon, and from Jehu of the House of Omri. So, in other words, all the events up through Jehu's coup likely happened in 841. And it's not just words, there's also a picture. In fact, it's the only existing depiction we have of an Iron Age Israelite or Judahite monarch. I'll post a pic online, but to give you the gist, it shows Jehu wearing a floppy cap and robe down on his hands and knees directly in front of the feet of Shalmaneser III, with Assyrian eunuchs framing the scene. Shalmaneser lists the Israelite tribute as silver, gold, a golden bowl, a golden beaker, golden goblets, pitchers of gold, lead, staves for the hand of a king, and javelins. And, possibly unmentioned, a few special jars of that sweet, sweet Nimshi brand honey. Okay, so let's head back north into Neo-Hittite territory. And just to remind you, I've posted some maps to help you navigate. Getting a handle on northern Syria around this time is a bit of a challenge. First off, Shalmaneser's inscriptions start becoming a bit less frequent and a bit more concise, dealing with particular incidents in particular kingdoms, which we'll cover in more depth. But the general landscape is hard to nail down. For example, the following year, 840 BC, Shalmaneser records collecting cedar in the Amanus Mountains, but there's zero mention of either conflict or tribute. He also never closes the loop on the earlier revolt of Sangara of Carchemish and Hadram of Bitagusi. The main thing we can infer is that the Neo-Hittite kingdoms were fairly quiescent leaving Shalmaneser free to direct his energy as it targets to the north and south. In 839, Shalmaneser marched on Quay, the kingdom of eastern Cilicia. By this time, the aged Quayan king, Kate, had been fighting the Assyrians for most of his life. He was part of the OG coalition forged by King Ahuni of Bitadini way back in 858 and he'd remained independent and anti-Assyrian right up until 843. That year, Kate had been defeated by Shalmaneser, forced to give tribute, and even surrender his daughter as a bride, which was some pretty humiliating stuff. The fact that Shalmaneser felt compelled to return suggests that, at the very least, Kate was a very reluctant vassal. In a brief inscription, the Assyrian king records attacking Quay, capturing their cities, and carrying off their spoil. The following year, Shalmaneser recrossed the Euphrates to confront the forces of King Hazael. And just King Hazael. No coalition, no allied armies, not even their most reliable partner, the Neo-Hittite kingdom of Hamath which merits some explanation, or at least speculation. Though it's not recorded, it appears that King Ura Helena of Hamath may have died around the same time as Hadad Azer, perhaps as a result of the same conflict. The loss of both kings appears to have shattered the long-standing proto-alliance, 
and most future mentions of Aram Damascus recorded as standing alone. There's also no further mentions of Hamath in Shalmaneser's annals, and it's very difficult, at least for me, to figure out the current relationship between Hamath and Assyria. There's no clear evidence that the kingdom was forced into vassalage. The only clues we have are a few Luwian hieroglyphic inscriptions from Ura Helena's son and successor, Urta Thomas. And it's probably no coincidence that all the inscriptions relate to the construction of fortresses. As an example, I am Urta Thomas, son of Ura Helena, king of Hamath. I myself built this fortress, which he of the Hurpata Riverland made, and in addition, the Halabians. Which might suggest that with the alliance broken, Hamath was focused on securing its borders against Assyria and Aram Damascus. To close the loop on 838, after fighting Hazael, Shalmaneser records seizing four Damascene cities and accepting the tribute of the Tyrians, Sidonians, and Gabalians, or people of Byblos. The following year, Shalmaneser targeted the region of Tabal, the former Hittite lower land, and exacted tribute from its 24 Neo-Hittite kings. It's likely that the Assyrian king planned further conquests to the north and west, because in 836 he made a strategic move. He records that, I captured Uatash, the royal city of Lala, of the land of Malachia. No reason is given, but he may have wanted to secure a northern river crossing to match the southern one at Kar Shalmaneser. He also records that, the kings of the land of Tabal arrived, and I accepted their gifts. The subsequent year, 835, Shalmaneser re-entered the Zagros. And if you're a Patreon subscriber, you'll be getting all the details on the various kingdoms and groups he encountered in the course of his multiple Zagros campaigns. In 834, Shalmaneser recorded that in my 25th year of rule, I crossed the Euphrates at its flood and received the gifts from all the kings of Hatti, which seems to reinforce the impression that the region was mostly docile. Well, except for Shalmaneser's targets. He continues that, I crossed over Mount Amanus to the cities ruled by Kate in the land of Quay. I went down, stormed, and captured Timur, his royal city. I killed their warriors, carried off their spoil, and destroyed, devastated, and set fire to countless cities. The repeated campaigns appear to suggest that Kate wasn't just being a tough nut to crack, but was probably in full-blown rebellion. Shalmaneser continues that, On my return, I seized Muru the royal city of Hadram of Bit Agusi, as a fortress for myself. I strengthened its thresholds and built a palace in it for my royal residence. The last time he'd mentioned Bit Agusi was around 15 years earlier, when the same King Hadram had conspired with King Sangara of Carchemish to withhold Assyrian tribute. The act may have cost Sangara his life, but Hadram had apparently been left in power as an Assyrian vassal king, at least until this year, when Shalmaneser seized his royal city for a new Assyrian fortress. If Muru actually was his capital, this was the occasion when the royal family relocated to Arpad, which had remained the Bit Agusi capital for the rest of the kingdom's existence. The following year, 833, we get an uncharacteristically verbose info dump, so I'll just let Shalmaneser take it from here. In my 26th year of rule, I crossed Mount Amanus for the seventh time, and for the fourth time, I marched against the cities ruled by Kate of Quay. I besieged Tanakun, the royal city of Tulka. The terrifying splendor of my lord Asur overpowered him. They came out and prostrated themselves at my feet. 
I accepted from him hostages, silver, gold, cattle, and sheep as tribute. Then I left Tanakun and attacked Laminash. The people of the land fled, climbing a steep mountain. So I stormed the mountain peak and captured them. I destroyed, devastated, and set fire to their cities. When I moved on to Tarzi, they prostrated themselves at my feet. So I accepted silver and gold as their tribute. What Shalmaneser appears to be describing here is an attack on two important sub-kingdoms, Tanakun and Laminash, under control of Kate of Quay. He apparently chose the appropriate targets to weaken the kingdom's defenses, because he next records that, I appointed Kiri, brother of Kate, as king of Quay. This is the last recorded mention of Kate, and it's interesting that Shalmaneser doesn't record defeating him, killing him, or capturing him, only appointing his brother in his place. It's possible Kate died of illness or old age, and Shalmaneser omitted the details out of a grudging respect for a tenacious, lifelong enemy. I know, it's just wishful thinking. Speaking of elderly kings, Shalmaneser was no spring chicken himself. After all, he'd spent 26 years waging brutal, hard-fought military campaigns at every point on the compass. Even assuming he was in his early 20s when he came to power, that lifestyle takes a heavy toll. And I'm not just waxing philosophical here, I'm actually heralding a pretty major development. The obelisk inscription for 832 starts out relatively pro forma. In my 27th year, I mustered my chariots and troops. Then cue the full-on reality show record scratch, because he continues that, at the head of my armies, I sent the Turtanu Dian Asur, commander of my immense armies, against Armenia. Yep, you heard that right. Even though he'd rule for six more years, Shalmaneser would never again personally lead an Assyrian campaign. Instead, he'd leave matters in the hands of his Turtanu, commander-in-chief, prime minister, and or vizier, a figure named Dian Asur. There's no reason to think the position was new. A senior general or chief advisor was probably a traditional role. What was new was delegating Assyrian warfighting to anyone other than the king. Because conquering land in the name of their god was basically the king's main role. The game changer, as you likely realize, was the scope of Assyrian conquests. As the empire grew and the king grew older, delegation became the order of the day. And I don't know about you, but I can't think of a single bad thing that could possibly, possibly lead to. Getting back to the year's campaign, in 832 BC, Shalmaneser dispatched Dian Asur against Armenia. The king records that first, he went down and attacked Bit Zamani, entering by the pass of Amash and crossing the Arzania River. Bitzamani was a powerful Aramean kingdom sited near the source of the Tigris. Though I didn't really cover it, Asher Nasser Paul II had repeatedly campaigned to control the kingdom before finally forcing it into vassalage. But it appears that it had rebelled once again. And the reason isn't too hard to understand. Because once Dian Asur attacked Bitzamani, the obelisk records that Sarduri the Urartian heard about it and trusted in the strength of his many troops, so he advanced against me to offer battle. And, ladies and gentlemen, you have just been formally introduced to one of the major players for this season. Because Sarduri I was the very first ruler of the unified kingdom of Urartu. And, oh my, do we really need to talk about Urartu. First off, just to throw it out there, Urartu was arguably the first strong kingdom to ever emerge in the region of eastern Armenia. 
Way back in the early Bronze Age, you'd had the Kura Araxes, named after two main rivers in the region, who'd migrated south after the Uruk collapse and eventually became known as the Hurrians. And like the Hurrians, the Arartians spoke an isolated language, unconnected from either Indo-European or Semitic. As far as we understand, the new Iron Age kingdom of Urartu was comprised of two main groups. One, as we discussed in episode C-16, were the Armenians, or the followers of King Arame. The second were the local Nairi tribes, who the Assyrians had been attacking on and off for the better part of four centuries. Seriously, since way back in episode C6, under Tukulti Ninurta I. As I noted in that episode, where Tukulti Ninurta had fought 40 Nairi kings, Tiglath Pileser I fought between 20 and 30, which wasn't so much a sign of weakness as a sign of consolidation. Well, now nearly three more centuries had passed, and they'd finally slimmed down to one. As historian Karen Radner notes, since relatively few Urartian inscriptions are preserved, Assyrian sources tend to influence, even dominate, the contemporary view of Urartu. Even the name Urartu is the conventional Mesopotamian term for Inner Anatolia, well attested in earlier sources. The Urartians' name for themselves, Bayanili, is preserved as van in both a city and lake in eastern Turkey, both of which I was lucky enough to visit way back in 2015, when I stayed at the Urartu Hotel. I'll post a few pictures. And of course, the name Urartu is preserved at Mount Ararat, the highest peak in the region. According to historian Tamas Dezso, Shalmaneser's early annals refer to Nairi lands as prime horse breeding country, and it's likely that in the mountainous terrain, the Nairi, i.e., the Proto Urartians, probably used more cavalry than chariotry, which may have given them a bit of an edge when fighting the Neo Assyrians. I should also mention that one of their main adoptions from the Neo Assyrians besides their successful military tactics, was their ancient cuneiform script. Radner notes that the earliest Arartian inscriptions were written by Sarduri I on a stone block at the fortress Van Kalesi. These early inscriptions used not only Assyrian cuneiform, but also the Assyrian language. According to Radner, it was also Sarduri I who proclaimed the god Haldi to be the head of Urartu's state pantheon, and he and his successors erected temples in Haldi's name all over their kingdom. Why Sarduri chose to promote Haldi as the main deity of Urartu remains unclear, but it is perhaps significant that Urartu's first capital, Arzashkun, the likely origin spot of its royal family, was probably situated not far from the city of Musasir, which held a major temple dedicated to the god. Historian Tugba Tanyeri Erdemir also proposes that promoting the worship of a new god, Haldi, was a conscious attempt to foster unity throughout the diverse geographic and cultural lands controlled by the Urartian kings. Radner continues that Haldi's importance in Urartian state religion and ideology meant that the kings of Urartu were crowned, or at least confirmed, in Haldi's main temple at Musasir, and that they visited the shrine regularly as part of their cultic duties. Despite this, Musasir retained its independence and was ruled by its own king with both Urartu and Assyria respecting its sovereignty. Though, for Assyria, that was different than respecting its territory. Put a pin in all this because there will be much, much more on Urartu to come. To loop back to where we started our discussion, 
The reason that Bitzamani likely revolted from Assyria was that they'd switched their allegiance to Urartu. And sure enough, when the Assyrian army attacked Bitzamani, Sarduri came to its defense. Shalmaneser records that, I fought with Sarduri and was able to defeat him. I filled the wide plain with the bodies of his soldiers. But, well, first off, Diane Asur led the attack, so you're welcome to drop the first person. And second, there's zero discussion of tribute, subjugation, or capture. In fact, I suspect that somewhere out there waiting to be excavated is another inscription by Sarduri I that goes a little something like this. I am just like my kingdom. I am young, scrappy, and hungry, and I'm not throwing away my shot. The Ancient World Podcast is part of the Airwave Media Podcast Network. Along with My History Can Beat Up Your Politics, The Explorers Podcast, and other great shows. 